Thank you for visiting Harvest Anglican Church. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you're blessed by this message, and we hope that you can join us next time we gather. So be sure to look at our website, harvestsc.org, and find the next worship event and join us. God bless you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Isn't that a great video? Thank you. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> All right. My oh, man. My oh, man, that's awesome. Can I get an amen for that? Woo. Can we get excited? I mean, can we still get excited about how God and what he has done, who he is and what he has done? Can we get excited about that? You know? Because God help us if we ever get to the place where we are bored with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the price that he paid for our redemption. Oh, what grace. Oh, what grace. God has shown us. Oh, what love, you know. I knew of a guy one time who used to go to church only on Easter Sunday and that was the only time he would go and and uh, suddenly he even quit doing that. And when he was questioned about it, he said, I don't know, every year the preacher says the same thing. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> womp, womp, womp. <laughs> of course it's the same thing. It's Resurrection Day. The resurrection of Jesus. And in fact, if he would come back every Sunday, you know what? We would talk about the resurrection then too. <laughs> Because it's that good of news. It is that good. God have mercy on the man who doesn't know the resurrection. God have mercy on the preachers who make the message of the resurrection of Jesus boring or meh, as these kids these days say. You know, the greatest enemy that we have to fear is death. And that enemy is defeated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Let's celebrate and be glad. We should jump out of our seats, you know, like we do at our ball games of our favorite sports teams. Because there's joy in the house of the Lord today as we sing earlier. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. But I know some of us don't like that. And that's fine, too. If you're not going to be jumping up and down and clapping your hands, if that's not your thing, we can bow our hearts in adoration. You know? We can bow our hearts in total submission and stand in awe and, and wonder at the risen King. Whatever brings honor to his name, because honor is what Jesus deserves. He's worthy of our place. King Jesus, risen and reigning who stood in our place, as we've been talking about all through this season of Lent up to this moment. He stood in our place. He faced what we could not face. Remember? 
He fought the battle that we could not fight over sin, over evil, over Satan himself, over death itself, and he won victory. He's victorious. Victorious. Christ the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome to Harvest Church again, everybody. Happy Resurrection Sunday. You know, it's our first one together. Isn't that special? I was up really, really early this morning. I couldn't sleep. I started journaling about 4.30. Praise God. Our first Easter Sunday as a baby church plant. That's exciting. That should get every one of us excited. Thanks be to God. You know, so I won't apologize for getting a little bit rowdy and passionate this morning. <laughs> you know, I'm excited. I'm excited. Someone take a picture of this moment because I want to mark it. Seriously, somebody. All right. I'm excited about what God is doing here with his church. This is heart. This is God's church. I'm not saying take a picture of me. <laughs> I love you, Casey. I'm just I guess that was a little bit confusing, wasn't it? I'm excited about what God is doing here at Harvest Church because it is His church. You know, I love in Revelation what it talks about in Revelation 1 and 2 that Christ is now risen and ascended and He walks among the lampstands. So it's really exciting to me to think about there's a lampstand planted now at Harvest Church and Christ walks among that. Isn't that neat? He hears the pray, prayers of the saints here. I just love that. I'm excited about what God's doing here at Harvest Church, but I'm most excited that Jesus is alive and reigning and ruling because that means that hope is alive and never dies. You hear me, church? Hope is alive and never dies. Today, as much as any other day throughout history, we have so much to be grateful for because today we remember and celebrate where our hope is anchored at the cross and the empty tomb. It's the day that we confess with all our hearts and we're going to do it in just a few minutes after the sermon with the Nicene Creed. In particular the words where he says for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried but on the third day rose again in accordance with the scriptures. I mean, this is the thing. This is not just a figure of speech. It's not symbolic. On the third day, Jesus Christ raised, actually, physically, literally, bodily resurrected. Otherwise, what are we doing here? Our hope would be lost and we'd be still stuck in our sins. Seriously, we would have absolutely no reason to be here. Might as well be fishing or doing yoga or sleeping in. And worse, all the suffering that we see and experience every single day, we'd be hopeless in that. All the mistakes that we've made, we'd have no hope of forgiveness and redemption. We'd have no victory without Christ's victory over the grave. The Apostle Paul says it best in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. He says, if there is no resurrection and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, meaning this present life, then we are to be pitied, Christians, are to be pitied more than anybody in the world. King James Version says we are the most miserable if that's what's the case. Yet incredibly to this day, heretical churches and false teachers try to dismiss the literal, physical resurrection, the virgin birth, that Jesus is the only way and truth and life. They try, to, they try to dismiss all that. They say, well, that couldn't have happened. He can't be the only way and truth and life. People don't rise from the dead. Well, no, duh. But Jesus isn't like anybody else, is he? Since when has anybody else been able to heal like Jesus heals? To calm the storms with his voice. To cast out demons with a word. To raise people from dead. To feed thousands and thousands of people from a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Since when has anybody been able to do that? So what else are you going to dismiss about the divinity of Christ that is proven at the resurrection? What else are you going to try to take away? Because if you take away any of it, you take away all of it, you're going to be left with what? Nothing but sinking sand. The entire foundation 
of our faith is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If not, what's the point of our gathering? I guess it would be like a self-help seminar or something like that. But let me just say this. If he didn't rise from the dead, there would really be no reason to pay attention to anything else he said. You ever think about that? People say he's like a great moral teacher and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, I always quote C.S. Lewis, and a lot of people do. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but Jesus isn't a great moral teacher if he said the things that he said about himself. C.S. Lewis says he was either a liar, a lunatic, or worse. Or he was the son of God. And we have to decide right here in this moment what we believe. We have to come to faith and belief in the resurrection of Jesus and all of the other miracles that he did for that matter through the lens of faith. Because the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. And you know, a lot of people have issues with that. Well, if you have an issue with that, you might want to take it up with God. But let me just say, God is God and you're not, so you're going to have a problem with that. And yet still, God helps us out. (laughs) He still helps us out with overwhelming evidence that has been witnessed and reported both in the scriptures and other ancient historical documents that drastically meet historical criticism by scholars and academics far more than any other ancient document and it ain't even close. I want to say that ain't because I want you to get your attention. It ain't even close. But you don't see academics disputing Homer or Plato. You know why? Because Satan doesn't care about the validity of those documents, does he? He could care less about those. So there's plenty of historical evidence about the scriptures. And then you, of course, look at the complete transformation of the disciples, the witness of the women at the tomb, which was unheard of in that time. I mean, the undisputed fact that these handful of ordinary people learned from this one Jewish man, Jesus of Nazareth, in this tiny little corner of dirt all the way on the other side of the world in Palestine, and then radically went forth and transformed the entire civilization as we know it, converted the most dominant pagan nation in the world, Rome, to Christianity. That just wouldn't happen apart from the resurrection. It just wouldn't. It's completely impractical. And I can go on and on and on with apologetics type of stuff, but I'm not going to do that. There's a lot more I could say. But I want to get to a couple of other things today. But the most obvious evidence. Now I say undisputed fact actually. Is that the tomb was empty. (laughs) The tomb is empty. The body of Jesus has never been found by anyone. Including the Jews and the Romans who be assured would have torn apart heaven and earth to find the body of Jesus. I mean, they didn't need this trouble. They wanted to bury his message. I'm not going out about it. That's just the devil trying to distract me. <laughs> they wanted to bury his message in the tomb forever. They didn't need it. For the soldiers that guarded it, it could have been death for them. For the Jewish leaders trying to silence them, it would have made chaos for them. <sighs> they would have looked everywhere for his body because they knew. That Jesus would have been like every other Jew or any other person that was crucified as a troublemaker. He would have been forgotten. But he raised from death. And there was no stopping the movement and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? He had physically raised from death. And look at how the world has changed. There was a, a historian. He wasn't even a Christian. But he put it this way, it was from his birth that most of the human race dates its calendars. Think about that. Yeah. It's in his name that millions pray, and get this, it is by his name that millions curse. You might think that's kind of odd. But I put that on purpose. Because that should tell us something. It should. You don't hear when people bump their heads on this, some hard like this, say, Muhammad got me. (laughs) 
or you know, bang their knee on the on the on the hardwood. Muhammad, Buddha. You don't hear that. Why? Because the one is risen. The one Jesus Christ is the risen one that Satan and all spiritual forces of darkness hate. The one who was they were put to open shame on the cross. That's why. It's as simple as that. It is spiritual warfare. So that should tell us something about the risen Christ. So let's get excited. The resurrection is real. The promise of the empty tomb. This, this is a writable, tweetable, whatever you want to say. The promise of the empty tomb is full of hope and victory for those who believe. Can I get an amen? amen. Even in the toughest and most fearful of circumstances, look at, at Jesus' disciples. They thought all was lost. Remember what Brother Pat read in Luke 24 today. The women who went to the tomb early that morning had just spent the most miserable Sabbath day of rest they could ever, ever experience after the worst day of their life. They were going to the tomb that early morning carrying spices and ointments for one singular purpose. You know what it was? It wasn't to greet a risen Savior. It was to anoint a dead man's body. See, they had no expectation of Jesus being raised. None. All hope was lost in the darkness of the cross. They were totally beaten down. I'm convinced that Jesus' death that we talked about Friday night was that brutal, that unthinkable, that unfathomable. That the, I mean, these women saw it. These women never left Jesus' side. They were there to the end and His last word as He breathed out on the cross, it is finished. They were, they've never left. They saw it carry out to its completion. And they watched His lifeless body be wrapped up in, in linen like that white linen there and put it and sealed in a tomb. And they had to endure and hear the awful thud of that massive stone close over the tomb. And they had to go home because the Sabbath was coming. Make no mistake. All their faith was dashed. Anyone in here feel like that sometimes? Anyone feel that dark? Or defeated? Well, I got some good news for you. You've come to the right place today. <laughs> because listen, as in verse 2 through 6, it says, As they approached the tomb, still dark, Okay. They found that massive stone, which it would have been a massive stone. The Romans and Jews, Jewish leaders wouldn't have had it any other way. They found that stone rolled away. In fact, other gospel writers said they, they, they were so grief stricken. The other gospel writers say, well, they were walking up there like, oh, by the way, how are we going to get this big rock off of? You know, it was a big stone. It was a big stone. And when they went inside, they didn't find the body there. Terrified. I want us to think about how, how terrified they were. They were met by two men in dazzling clothes. Matthew's Gospel says that their clothes gleamed like lightning. I mean, they were certainly angels, right? And they said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how He told you? Now, I had to, when I was studying the text this week, I had to smile. I had to smile because I kept thinking about the tender smile of the angels and these women who were so broken. I had to just, I just imagined in my mind's eye them saying, smiling tenderly, remember how he told you. See, Jesus did tell his disciples numerous times on the way to Jerusalem exactly what was going to happen. He told them numerous times that he was going to be arrested, spit upon, mocked, beaten, killed, but rise on the third day. Okay? That was exactly what they had. But again, the crucifixion, the events of it were so horrific, so traumatizing, it was only being called to remembrance by the angels in this moment that they began to understand the significance of all that Jesus taught them. 
All that Jesus had said on that road to Jerusalem. The light began to flicker. That flicker of hope. Anybody ever had that little... You've been completely in darkness and you had that little flicker of hope come alive? Well, it came alive in a big way in the tomb here. And they ran black back to the others. They told them. Of course, they all think they were crazy. But they said, hey, everything is going to be okay. Actually, it's going to be more than okay. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be spectacular. The same is true for us. I want every one of us to hear that today, church. It's why we return year after year to celebrate the empty tomb. It's why we return Sunday after Sunday to celebrate the empty tomb. Day after day sometimes. For me, it's moment after moment sometimes I come to the empty tomb. Some of us are like Peter. I find myself like Peter. I run like an ox as fast as I can to the tomb. Huffing and puffing. I just imagine him as kind of a burly dude like me, you know? I don't know why. But I run to the empty tomb to see it, to remember that Christ rose on the third day just like He said He would. And that it's all going to be okay. It's actually going to be spectacular. Resurrection assures us of that. It assures us of the eternity that Christ is preparing for us. The eternity that begins right now when we accept Jesus Christ into our lives. Accept Him and believe in Him as Lord and Savior. I mean, it's true for each one of us. And it's true even for people all the way across the world that are huddled up in fear. I mean, think about if you're in Ukraine, war-torn Ukraine right now, barely hanging on by a thread. It's going to be spectacular. Because He goes to prepare a place for us. And He's coming back for us. And He will take us to be with Him forever. And there will be no more war. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more mourning or crying or weeping. That's the good news of the resurrection. And it's assured. It's assured by His resurrection. Resurrection changes everything. Doesn't it? I saw a tweet this morning and I meant to write it down. I'll try to remember it. If Jesus didn't rise, or excuse me, if Jesus rose, nothing else matters. If Jesus rose, nothing else matters. If Jesus didn't rise, nothing matters. I mean, we might as well just go eat, drink, be happy, pay taxes, and die. Jesus did rise. And He gives us hope. And He gives us victory in the face of even unspeakable tragedy. As I close today, I want us to consider something. I'm going to get the mic just so you hear me. I don't have to scream anymore. I want us to consider something really heavy. A few weeks ago, I was speaking to a pastor friend of mine about the school shooting at Tanglewood Middle. And I don't know if you remember, those of us that live in South Carolina, the, the case about five years ago with Dylan Roof, uh, the young white supremacist who went into Mother Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston. Y'all remember that story? Tragic story. He went into a Bible study and they actually loved on him for quite a while, but he still decided in his heart hate-filled heart to shoot and kill nine people of that church just because they were black. Horrific. Just six days after the deadly shooting, protesters from out of town attempted to disturb the city's prayer memorial service. I don't know if y'all remember that. And the church members of that church said, nah, love beats everything. And they started to sing hymns. And the protesters walked away. The first Sunday back in worship after the shooting, the pastor stood up amongst the congregation like I am now. And I'm sure you can imagine that you could have heard a pin drop in there. But all of a sudden, he comes up to the pulpit. He looks out and he just erupts. Praise God! 
and the whole place went nuts. How? It's the hope. It's the victory of the resurrection. That's how. It's the promise of the resurrection, folks. That's the only way you can say praise God. I was talking to my wife a few nights ago. She was telling testimony of somebody who lost their son. After, you know, he was a mess growing up. He'd always gotten in trouble. He finally turned his life around. Finally, I think, gave his life to God. And then he was tragically killed in a motorcycle accident. His wife got up at the funeral and was like, praise God. How? Resurrection. This place is not our home. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. You know, I'll never forget. I mean, this, this whole story of Emmanuel rocked the whole nation. And uh, Felicia Sanders is, is the mother of one of the nine victims. And he told Dylan Roof at his sentencing, he said, I forgive you. May God have mercy on your soul. Rose Simmons, a victim's daughter, told, told Roof to his face also, I love my father. I'm going to miss my father. But I don't grieve so much for my father or his eight companions because I know they are in a place of unspeakable peace. Resurrection. Peace. You know, the disciples on that first Easter Sunday morning outside the doors was total chaos. They were surrounded by people who wanted to kill them. But we have resurrection. The hope, the victory, the promise of resurrection. Amen, church. So I pray that we would go forth from this place in joy, not sorrow. In peace and not in loss. Okay? I pray that we would go forth as resurrection people to live the risen life full of hope, full of victory, full of love, full of promise, and that we share it with the whole world as we remember as those first ladies were called to do, to remember that he is risen just as he said. The empty tomb is full of hope and victory for those who believe. Let the church say, Amen, Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.